Welcome to the Malibu Saturday night meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Shirley and I'm an addict alcoholic. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and all members of the community are welcome to attend. The single most important aspect of AA recovery, however, is the principle of one alcoholic relating to another alcoholic. Therefore, only alcoholics actually participate in our meetings. If your primary problem is other than alcoholism, we think it would also be helpful to you to contact an anonymous organization that more specifically deals with your addiction. In any case, we hope that you can learn here. What you learn here may be helpful to your recovery and or understanding. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. I have identified myself as an alcoholic. Are there any other alcoholics here tonight? <laughs> Great. Not to embarrass you, but so that we may get to know you at the coffee break and after the meeting, will the people in their first 30 days of sobriety please stand when I point to you and give us your name and your disease. Should we start in the back? Uh, Robert Hi, Robert. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jennifer. You? <laughs> Hi. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Tony. I guess we're on this side of the room. Hi, Mint. Hi, William. Hi, Richard. Is there anyone else I'm missing? Great, welcome. If there are any visitors from the outside greater Los Angeles area, would you please stand and as I point to you, give us your name and town and your home group. Hi. Hi. Hi, David. Welcome, you guys. Will you please raise your hands if there are any empty seats next to you? Great, thank you. The heart of our program is defined in Chapter 5 of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Tonight I have asked Pete to read this for us, or better known as Six Page Pete. My name is Peter and I'm an alcoholic. Chapter 5, how it works. Somewhere. <laughs> I don't have it memorized, that's for sure. <laughs> there we go. Chapter 5, how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, 
what happened and what we are like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. At some of these we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, but the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us, but there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a fearless and searching moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Many of us exclaimed, What an order! I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism, and C, that God could and would if he were saw. Okay, and the format of this meeting is one 15-minute speaker, Birthdays, a short coffee break, and a main speaker. Uh, now let's have a hand for our first speaker. And I just want to say that tonight we have two friends from Orange County. And I don't know uh, Trudy real well, but I'm certainly getting to know her. And she's a terrific lady. Thank you, Trudy. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, my name's Trudy. I'm an alcoholic. I like to repeat what a friend of mine from Maine always used to say when she introduced herself. She'd say, my name's Sandra. I'm an alcoholic and an addict. I'm addicted to anything I can get a physical sensation from or a mental obsession with. Uh, that fit really well for me. I've yet to meet an addiction that I don't have. I'm sure there are more out there for me to discover. Uh, <laughs> I'll get through it one way or another. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a long and wonderful process for me. I've been in this program for a lot of years, and yet I come here tonight and uh, I feel like a real newcomer. I'm nervous. I've been kvetching to my friends all day about speaking. Um, I've been turning down speaking commitments for a long, long time, and I got away with it until today when my sponsor asked me to speak. And when I said, no, I don't think so, she said, I don't think so, you know. So, so here I am, pretty much um, scared to death, but I'm going to do it. Because what I know about you people out there is that we're all part of the same family. Uh, I have more in common with you than I have with any other group of people I've ever known. And when I come here, I feel like I'm home. I feel like I belong. I feel loved no matter what kind of warts I'm wearing today. 
Um, I feel warm. I go away feeling as though I've been sustained in many, many ways and respected and honored and loved just for being alive. And uh, that's a really special thing and a gift we don't find in many places in this world. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. I thought I had 10 minutes, and I've got to stretch it out to 15. I'll do the best I can. Um, I grew up in Maine, small town on the coast, two sisters and a brother. Both my parents were alcoholic and had some other very uh, serious acting out behavior, which I later came to find out about. And I, I grew up in this idyllic small town where you could run from one end to the other, miles and miles, and somebody would always know who you were and who you belonged to. It was a real safe place to grow up, but on another level, I never felt safe. And I grew up never wanting to be in my home. I wanted to be somewhere else all the time. Uh, my parents weren't really available to me or to any of the kids in my family. They did the best they could, and we were neglected. And that's just the way it was. And I took my solace where and when I could. I hid in books. I read a lot. I ate a lot of sweet food. I uh, created other families that I felt comfortable with and spent as much time with them as I possibly could. And I got by. I, I wasn't one of those children who had that feeling that I never belonged. I, I felt I did belong to that community and to my schools and to the groups of friends that I had. And I was pretty comfortable with that. And it's a good thing I had that because home and family was where I didn't feel that I belonged. Uh, I had my first drink when I was 18. And I went to that drink very mindlessly in my mind. I knew that my dad was an alcoholic. It was talked about endlessly in my home. My parents had divorced many years before. I knew that he was a violent alcoholic. Uh, I witnessed that as a young child before my parents separated. But knowing that he was an alcoholic had nothing to do with me picking up that first drink. I made absolutely no connection. And uh, at the same time, I didn't get euphoric or happy. I didn't feel like I had found my best friend when I had that drink. I had a sense of loss. I had a feeling of impending doom that I didn't quite understand at the time, but I felt that some piece of my innocence had, had been given away with that first drink. I don't recall that I got particularly drunk. Um, I drank cautiously for quite a while. Uh, but I, I do remember at some point in my freshman year in college, stealing kitchenware from the kitchen of my dorm to give to some guy I was dating for his apartment. And I was drunk when I did that. And I knew the next day when I woke up that that's not something I would have done sober. And that when I drank, my value system changed. That didn't stop me. Uh, you know, I, I continued on drinking some in college, ended up marrying uh, a man I met there who was very charismatic, a ton of fun, and a very heavy drinker. He would do things like ride into the local drinking spot uh, just off campus on his motorcycle with me on the back of it, and I thought that was really cute. Uh, I didn't stop to think what kind of a parent he would be or I would be under those circumstances, but um, I ended up marrying him, and we moved to a ski resort, had two kids, partied very, very hard with a lot of different people there. You know, when you live in a resort, uh, it's party time 24-7. And you can be, you, it's a great place for alcoholics and drug addicts to hide out. You can, uh, you don't look that bad. Everyone else who's there for the week or the weekend is doing just what you're doing. They don't know that you're doing it 52 weeks a year, and they're going to go home and recover and act normal, or more or less normal for a while. Um, You know, that marriage ended. I now had a two-year-old and a six-year-old, and I was living on my own. And uh, I found that I was repeating some of the neglectful behavior that I suffered at my parents' hands, that I'd much rather be out in that rock and roll bar on Friday and Saturday night, and maybe Thursday and Wednesday, um, and uh, wondering you know, where my next date was going to be or what my next drink was going to be. And, and not thinking too much about those two children. And I know they suffered a lot from that. I, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'd drink and I'd pick up guys. That's, that's what I did. My theme song was, take the ribbon from my hair. 
you know, help me make it through the night. And um, I'm not sure who helped who make it through the night, but uh, that's how my life went for a long time. After after a while, I was very estranged from my family. I I had one of the, I did that geographic thing. I left my mother, my two sisters, somewhere else back on the coast of Maine, and I moved several hundred miles away. And I kept my I kept my contact with them very limited because my memories of childhood and home were were, um, were made me very sad, and I, I it was they weren't happy. So off I went, and I wasn't really in touch with my family. My sister called me one day. After uh, we had just buried my brother, who was killed at age 32 in an automobile accident in Florida, and my mother and I had gone down to take care of the burial arrangements and discovered in his house as we were cleaning things out about 40, 45 different prescriptions for quaaludes from every doctor in South Florida. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how it was in my family. We all did what we had to to get by. There was a lot of pain. We came from a very shame-based background. I don't know where it all came from. And what we did was medicate ourselves any way we could. And that was his choice. That was his choice. I don't know that that's what killed him, but uh, that was a huge loss for me. And it was a huge loss for my mother. He, she was very close to her only son. And about a month after he had died, my sister called me and said, Mother is in treatment in Bangor. I'm tired of bailing her out of jail. I didn't know my mother had been arrested and in jail, but she, she had been many times, as it turns out, drinking, driving. And uh, she said, you ought to come over with us. And my sister was sober, and I didn't even know that. She'd been sober for a year. And I said, no, I'm going to Martinique sailing with some friends. We're leaving right in the middle of this. I can't go. And uh, I kept getting these calls from this treatment center, and finally somebody there said, you know, it's usually the people who've been hurt the most who won't come. And something about that caught me. And, uh, you know, I think this was a moment of divine intervention for me because a little voice in me said, you know, you're miserable. You live a life of fear and anxiety. You hate yourself. You look good on the outside, you think, but you don't feel good inside. Maybe there's something here that you need to look into. And I canceled that vacation, made a couple of people really cross, and I ended up driving 200 miles round trip four days a week to Bangor, Maine from Sugarloaf Mountain in the western part of the state to take part in this family program. And you know, a couple weeks into that, I stopped drinking. I stopped drinking and I went to Al-Anon. Well, it's better than not stopping drinking at all, I guess. You know, I, I, wasn't, sure, I, I wasn't sure I was an alcoholic. But I wasn't going to take any chances because I'd been, you know, I've heard that alcoholism is a disease you treat with an education. And in those four weekly trips for four weeks to Bangor, Maine, I got a pretty good education. And I learned that if you, both your parents were alcoholic, you had a 99% chance of becoming one. And I knew that both my parents were alcoholic. And I knew my chances weren't good. Well, everybody else knew I was already an alcoholic. But I didn't. Uh, so I, I did stop drinking. And um, I started going to Al-Anon, and that worked for me for a year, year and a half, maybe two years. And then I met a guy. And uh, he was making me crazy, which was not unusual. Every man I met made me crazy. Um, but this was the first guy I'd met since I'd been sober that I was really interested in. And he was making me real crazy, and the idea of having a drink popped into my head. Now, I'd been around Al-Anon enough, and AA, I don't know if it's like this out here, I haven't noticed it so much, but in Maine, you know, your groups are small, there aren't so many people there, and you have a lot of joint meetings, you, you'll have like a St. Patrick's Day meeting with Al-Anon and AA, and everybody brings food, and there's a potluck, so I got to a lot of AA meetings when I was in Al-Anon, and I knew that I could go to an AA meeting if I didn't want to drink, that the only requirement for membership was a desire not to drink. And at that moment, I had a desire not to drink. Because, you know, over the years, my drinking had taken me to some very uncomfortable places. And uh, I had hangovers that were, that were lasting three days. You know, it wasn't like that when I was 18, but by the time I was 35 or 36, I was paying a huge price for my drinking. And uh, things were not going well in my life. 
I was not happy with me, and a lot of people weren't happy with me. And I kept saying, what is wrong? I don't know what is wrong. I was truly living a life of quiet desperation that we hear about, we talk about in here. And, you know, I think the thing for me was that I grew up not having the things I needed to feel good from early on, and I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know how could I could feel. All I knew was I felt bad, I drank, I got someone to take the ribbon from my hair, I felt better for a couple of days. And that's how it went for a long, long time. And I had these two kids who were crying out for attention, and one of them rather vocally. Uh, my daughter, the youngest of my two children, had memorized the number of every bar in the ski resort I lived in. And she would call them at will, any night she was home alone and lonely, and say, is my mother there? You know, and I used to give her a hard time for doing that, this little kid looking for her mom. And I'd be mad at her for wanting me to come home because that's what alcoholism did to me. That came first. I was totally selfish and self-centered. Whatever I wanted was what I went for and to hell with the rest of you, including two little babies. Um, so, you know, I, I got sober when my mother went into treatment. And I loved waking up without hangovers. And I only had the shakes for a little bit. You know, it wasn't too bad. I had some headaches around 90 days. But, you know, overall it wasn't too bad. And people in AA let me come in there. They let me come in and go on and on about whether I was or I wasn't. And they said I didn't have to say I was until I was ready to. But I could come and listen and talk. They were just glad to have another body in the room. You know, there'd be meetings there with 10 people. There'd be meetings there with three people. It was a very small community. We would drive some nights 60 miles one way over icy winter roads to go to an AA meeting. Um, so, you know, things started to get better a little bit at a time. I liked being sober. I grew to like being sober. Um, I hadn't had a lot of losses while I was drinking, which is... I, I don't know, it's just the way it worked out for me. Those losses came later. I, I had my own business, I had a lot of things going on. I ended up having to do a lot of, make a lot of changes and go through a lot of uh, losses in early sobriety. I had to struggle with some depression, I guess it was depression now I would say. Um, I could function, but I'd drive along the roads up there, there was this winding valley road that went along a, a river and some very steep banks. I had to fight myself day after day from driving off the side because somehow that seemed like a better alternative than, than living, getting my act back together, getting my life together, and living a life and dealing with the loss of my brother, who was my favorite sibling. You know, uh, I, I didn't, all, you know, I lost my brother and I got sober a month later. I had no, no resources to deal with that in a healthy way, and it was really hard. And my kids kept me alive. I would not insult them by killing myself when they were young. As bad a parent as I thought I was, was, I would not leave them. And, you know, over the years of my early sobriety, those kids gave me a really rough time. They hated me sober, and they used to tell me that because they had figured out over the years just what string to pull and what to push and what to do and what not to say or do to make their lives work. And they were furious because they had to start all over because nothing worked anymore. I woke up. You know, I came too. And I was acting like a real parent. And they were incensed. They were completely incensed. Um, and they gave me a real hard time about it for a couple of years. Fortunately for me, I, I had some sort of a sense of humor about that. And I would try not to laugh while they were having their little tantrums, but I'd turn my head and just kind of laugh to myself because I knew what was going on. Nothing worked anymore, and they had to start over, and damn, it was hard. Um, but, you know, those kids are now 32 and 36. I just spent Christmas with them. They love me. They respect me. They honor me. They cherish me. And I was a real bad mommy until they were 8 and 12, something like that. So I, I guess the message from that is there is, there is hope. Uh, my family is intact today. I know if I'd continued to drink, uh, I, never, I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have lived. I can remember the last year I drank coming down off the access road to the ski hill in my little Peugeot. And uh, I, I was having fun. I'd had a nice night of drinking and partying. I was kind of wound up. And I went into a skid, and, and I was up on two wheels of the car, and all I could see was a big snowbank on my left. And um, it's a good thing it was there, because if I'd rolled that car, it would have been good. But you know, the car didn't roll. 
it came back down, and I, and I made it home with my heart in my throat. But there were so many close calls. It couldn't have gone on forever like that. You know, so I know that I owe my life to this program as well. Um, how much time do I have left? Two minutes? <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, what's happened for me since I've been here is that I've started to grow up just a little bit. Um, I haven't really wanted to grow up a lot, but in some ways it's, it's worked out really well for me. I've, I've worked really, really hard to become the person I think I was meant to be, uh, rather than that facade who hid behind a drink and a couple of guys here and there. And the, the things in this program that turned out to, to mean the most to me, that I've had to work on the most, was letting go of the self-will. And I was just overrun with that, as probably a number of people here are. And finding a level of humility that allowed me to live in the world with you and with other people without having to take advantage of you and without letting you take advantage of me. It's been really hard. It's been really hard. But it's worked out really well. Um, I have a life today that I'm satisfied with, that I'm happy about. I have relationships that I cherish. I have friends who mean a lot to me that I can count on. I have the ability to give something back, uh, even if I don't take every speaking commitment that comes my way. You know, I, I learned, I read something this morning that said that Love isn't doing big things, it's doing little things with, with, uh, with great love. And that's what I can do today. I can do little loving things for the people in my life that I care about. And I can come to meetings and try to be available to people and take tough keep speaking commitments from time to time. Um, you know, I, I've become a person that I, I'm happy to be today. And I know that I have a family and a program that will solve all my problems if I will let it. And letting this program work in my life is sometimes the hardest thing I have to do. Every tool I need to solve every problem that comes up in my day is here, if I take advantage of it. Sometimes, um, I think one of the reasons I was you know, fussing about this commitment was, today I feel like I'm working my program with a small p. You know, I've let life get in the way, I've got other things going on, and uh, I've been skating a little. And, uh, you know, thanks, Megan, for making me stand up and talk about it. Thank you. Our group is self-supporting through our own contributions. We will now observe the seventh tradition Please remain seated. This is not a break. While the baskets are being passed, we have a few announcements from our co-secretary, Dan. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm an alcoholic and your co-secretary. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we are self-supporting through our own contributions. Please be as generous as possible with the Severn Tradition. If this is your first meeting, there are no dues or fees in AA. All expenses for the meeting are taken from your donations. If you are celebrating a birthday, it is a custom at this meeting to donate $1 for each year of sobriety. This is only voluntary, and please use this can. Uh, this meeting also provides child care. If you would like to tip the babysitter, please use... There's another can up here somewhere for that. If you have questions about our literature, see Willis. He's sitting right over here. He will be up here at the break after the meeting, right over here by the literature rack that has no literature in it. We taped this meeting... Tapes can be purchased from our tape person, Christopher. You'll find him on this side of the stage over here after the meeting. Very important, there is no smoking of any kind on the school grounds. No cigarettes, no incense. Even if your ass is on fire, take it to the curb out by the street. When it's done smoking, you can come back in. Um, but I do want to thank all of you because I've noticed there's no cigarette butts on the ground lately, and that's very important here because little kids are here during the week. So if you see one, please throw it in a trash can. Not, don't throw the kid in the trash can, throw the cigarette butt in the trash can. If you would like to smoke before the meeting or during the break, you must do so at the curbside out to my right. Butt cans are provided. If you would like to save a seat at this meeting, you may do so after 6.30. Please only save a seat for yourself and one other person. If you parked on the street, please move your car during the break to one of the large parking lots. The small lot, small lot is 
That's the one over here by the kitchen. That's for people with commitments. And we've been having a problem with that lot. So if you don't have a commitment here, please don't park there. Okay? Last week was kind of crazy. Um, let's see. What am I missing? There are sodas and water in the back. We do recycle, so please use the recycle can provided. When you hear the bell, that means the break is over and it's time to get back to your seat. Please do so quickly so we can hear the 12 traditions and give our main speaker plenty of time. And please remember who you see here and what you hear here. Let it stay here. <laughs> Last, if you need fellowship after the meeting, some of us go to coffee. Please see me and I'll give you directions. Thank you for letting me be of service. I guess the can. I guess this is the can. Is this what was yeah, passed? Sorry. Okay. Um, we celebrate birthdays with a candle for each 365 days of continuous sobriety. Tonight we have now 16 birthdays. We will sing happy birthday to them all. Oh, we need all of them to come up. So I guess I call them and their people. No. Do they all, do I start, do I say their names now? No. No. They all come up. They just all come up. Okay. It's probably her. Oh, well, all the birthday people uh, and the cake givers, please come up on the stage now. Thank you, honey. And then wait till all they, they all get up here. And then okay. And then we sing this one time. Do we sing first? Or after? Yeah. Happy birthday. Oh, okay. And then they come up and they talk. Yes. And then we'll do them one by one. First year. I don't want to talk in that. Surely. Okay. But the microphone, everybody can hear out there. So did, was there just one ad for the seven Two. years? Two. So ads. I added uh, 16. You added? So there's. I said there's 16 people. Okay. Yeah. But where's the other one? Head for seven, and then where's the other ad? One year, is that it? This one and this one. <laughs> Tell me when you want me to start. Okay. Okay. We celebrate birthdays with a candle for each 365 days of continuous sobriety. Tonight we have 16 birthdays. We will now sing happy birthday to them all. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Keep coming back. I was just told you have 45 seconds each. So, good luck. Okay, I'm going to call the first one is Kristen for one year, and the cake givers are Eileen, Christine, Brooke, Laura, and Wendy. Thank you all so much. Thank you to my beautiful friends. I have such beautiful friends now. And um, oh, my name's Kristen, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, you know, I have a I have a good friend in myself, and I have a good friend in God. So I'm free today, and thank you all very, very much. Okay. We now have Matt, and for one year, and Chris will give him his cake. Yeah. 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 
My name is Matt. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I want to thank Chris a lot. Uh, I went out a couple of times, and he told me he wasn't in the throwaway business. And uh, I'm still here, and I got a year today, and it's been a great year. So thank you very much. Our next is Joe for two years, and Heidi will give him the cake. Hi, my name is Joe. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, really glad to be here. Thank you for all your support. I thank my wife for her support, Heidi, and uh, Deborah, and Mary, and therapist Terry. Um, and I'm just, just happy to have two years. It gets, kind of, it gets easier. Um, the first day is the hardest, and I just stay focused. Thank you. Okay, we have Shauna for three years, and Mom, Dad, Aaron, Joe, and Deborah. Right. Hi, I'm Shauna. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I just want to thank everybody for... What's so funny? Okay. <laughs> I just want to thank... Um, okay. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank all of these people for coming. My parents came from Utah. Arnon made it here. He was out of the country and he came just in time. Joe was, I think, on his deathbed yesterday and he's here. And, and De Deborah's had a busy day with a two-year-old birthday party and she made it. So everybody, I mean, really means a lot to me that they came and to support me and um, I just sobriety is the greatest gift I could have ever I couldn't have imagined I mean it's beyond my dreams it's just it's amazing the, the biggest gift I've ever been given and um, I just remember how filled with fear I was when I first came and I mean I didn't even know it I was because I was so cut off from it but I just I look back now and I was just I was just afraid of everything. Everything was difficult, and my life has changed entirely. I just, it's amazing today, and it's just, just from coming, coming to meetings, um, working the steps, and uh, and a, a contact with my higher power. That's one of the most important. Anyway, and I want to thank all of you. We have Ted for seven years, and Dan, Aaron, Wills, and Jennifer. <laughs> Ted, alcoholic. Seven years, am I cured? Cured now? No more meetings. That's it. It's all over. Thank you. I really just came up here to say thank you and goodbye. I'm all done. Um, actually, it's not true. I, um, I spent a little time this year. You know, uh, people screw off off this program, and you don't see them again. And, and uh, I, I kind of took a half-hearted swing at that this year. I, I tried to make my life go and the outside stuff in my life go, and maybe I don't need to go to meetings too much, a little tune-up now and then, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, not only didn't that work, but I really have to ask myself why, like why that would be desirable. I like meetings, you know. I have tremendous friends in this fellowship and in this program. And, and you know, you all have been teaching me for the last seven years how to be a grown-up, you know, how to be a functional, somewhat, you know, calm and peaceful, integrated person. And all of that comes from here. You know, I had no clue about any of that. I didn't even know that that was desirable. Um, before I got here. So um, thank you very much. I'm happy. Thanks. Okay, and next we have Cindy for nine years, and it's Karina, Nicole, Anna, and Susan.
Hi, I'm Cindy, and I'm a grateful alcoholic. I want to thank all these women. Most of them have been in my life since the beginning. And uh, if you're new, I was taught you can't keep it unless you give it away. And uh, today I'm not alone because I have God. I have a loving God today in my life. And uh, they, t they told me that I would only want to hang out with alcoholics when I got here, and I laughed. I said, don't, you don't understand, I have friends. And today, that's all I want in my life. And um, I'm never alone because I always have God. And uh, get a sponsor and take direction, and uh, your life, like mine, will change. And uh, thank you all. We have Michael for nine years and S.J. My name is Michael. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm sober today by the grace of God and the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm a lot calmer than I was this morning. This is my birthday today. And things are a lot different than they were nine years ago. And um, I'm here because, you know, an, an unshakable trust in God and great friends like SJ and um, people like every one of you out in this room. And to anybody that's new, this deal works. So please, you know, stay here. Um, you don't have to be alone again. Thank you for sharing my birthday. We have Robbie for nine years, and Jennifer will give him his cake. Hi, I'm Robbie. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I want to thank Jennifer. She uh, has come back, and she's a good friend of mine, and I absolutely um, hope she finds some hope here for herself. I love you very much. Um, I love the sound of nine. I mean, I mean, I never thought I'd be nine, and then I realized when I was standing in the mirror saying nine that it sounds like mine. <laughs> So I thought, that's why I like this number. So, no, because I understand mine, because I, you know, I came here very self-centered and selfish. And, um, and what I know today is that I have a loving God in my life, and I could not have told you that last year. Um, I've had a lot of miracles that have happened in the last year for me, and um, it's worth it. It's worth taking the time and just one day at a time sitting, staying sober because it does get better. It gets different. It gets difficult, but it does get better. Thanks. We have 11 years now. Alex and Robert will give him his cake. I'm Alex. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Alex. Uh, thank you, Robert. One of my best friends. And uh, glad to have you in my life, Ben. When I was uh, 17 and I got sober, at that time, if you were the parent of a son or daughter who was associated with me, I was your worst nightmare. <laughs> Believe me. Um, that is not the case today, thank God. And I've worked on uh, not being that nightmare. So uh, I'm really grateful to be sober. Um, and of course you always forget what you want to say, but, uh, I'm just glad to be sober, man. You know, it's just incredible. I'm just so grateful and, uh, and everything's really, really good. If you're young, there's some young guys here. It can work for you. Believe me. You know, my first time was, I was 15. So, uh, you know, and I decided 17, it was, it was time. So it can work if you're young, believe me. And, uh, that's it. Thanks. We now come to a special friend of mine. This is Leslie for 13 years. Megan, Alex, Robin, and Connie will give her the cake. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Leslie, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Thank you, Alex and Megan and Connie and Robin, for giving me my cake. Um, two of my friends came to give me a cake, and they're not even alcoholics. <laughs> it's really special. I'm an alcoholic. Twelve traditions. One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. I like this, Shirley. Two, for our group purposes, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group, conscious. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Four, each group should be autonomous, except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group should have but one primary purpose to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise. Less, mon less problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service boards may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Ten, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name must never be drawn into public controversy. Eleven, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. 12. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Now I think I get to introduce. Um, I just want to say that the miracle of being a sober alcoholic is the people that we meet. And your next speaker I met, as I said earlier, when she took her cake after she got sober. And we have had just, she is my best friend, Megan. Hi there, my name is Megan Doherty, and I'm an alcoholic. And I, I told you I'd be speaking again. <laughs> uh, shortly after I was sober, I was at a meeting in Hollywood where I, I pretty much got sober. And uh, I went into a, a woman's meeting, and there was a young lady sitting, um, leading the, going to lead the meeting. And I looked at her, and she looked so positive, and she looked so together and I thought I have absolutely nothing in common with this person and she must have been born with a silver spoon and um, so I but I sat there and so she opened her mouth and she said my name is Trish and the last time I'm an alcoholic and the last time I was in Hollywood was about six seven years ago and I was turning tricks for a pack of cigarettes and I just looked at her, you know, and uh, then she went on with her story. Well, fortunately for me, I didn't have to go that far. And um, some of us do and some of us don't. I am convinced that in my life, the disease of alcoholism has been passed down from many generations. So when I tell my story, I have to begin with my parents. Um, my mother drank two Brandy Alexanders in her life, and they gave her a headache. And uh, my father was an explorer up, up north. He was from Glasgow. And um, they, got, they met on board ship, shipboard romance, all of that, and they got married. And uh, he moved her to Quebec City, and um, she became pregnant. Now in the meantime, I think she had been there about a month when he was shipped up north again. 
and she had become pregnant. And she um, gave birth in time to this little girl, and she had moved back to Philadelphia where her parents were. And uh, the baby was born, her name was Paula, and she got to be, I guess, about three months old, and suddenly she died. And come to find out that she died of a very serious, uh, obviously, venereal disease. And apparently, my father had picked it up in, um, with the Eskimos, and, um, and he didn't know it. And uh, so <clears throat> my mother left him for a while, and because of her religion, she went back to him. And uh, they went to Scotland, where she gave birth eventually to a couple of other children. Now, they came back to Canada, and um, she became pregnant again, and I was born. And I was the girl that she had lost, and she was so thrilled. And I was the guilt. He took one look at me, and I was the guilt. And um, so he took one look at me, and he disliked me, and uh, that's the way it went. So in, when I was growing up, and I, I was one of five children, the only girl, I used to say I was a rose among thorns, and I was right. And I was loved and treasured by my mom because I was a girl. And I was only, in his eyes, I was only a girl. So I grew up with this dichotomy. And uh, my father was an alcoholic. And I used to see him falling down. My story is there's been a lot of pain in my life. And that's my story. And some of us may have been luckier in the choices that we've made. But the choices that I, were in my life are my life. And that is my story. When I was a child, um, my father was an engineer when, after he came back from being an explorer. And he always worked. He worked his whole life. But he used to always stop at a bar on the way home. And when I was growing up, I would always be ashamed because I'd have to walk by this neighborhood bar in Philadelphia. And I would smell the booze coming from this bar. And I, was, I always felt so icky. And so l the reason I mention that is because if you think for one minute that I liked the idea of being an alcoholic, I would rather have had leprosy. You know, to me, that is the worst possible thing that could have happened to me. I had my first drink when I was 13 years old, went into a blackout. It was a New Year's Eve. And uh, I was one of these real skinny little kids. and. Uh, I had no breasts when my girlfriends did, so I uh, used, I had a bra, so I would stuff it with these things. You know, we used to wear these things on our hair, and I, I would stuff it. And uh, the, I was so mortified because my first new, big New Year's, I remember having a couple of drinks at my aunt's house. The next thing I knew, I was vomiting, and my aunt and one of our, her neighbors were holding me up and undressing me, and to my great humiliation, I had these things coming out of my bras. <laughs> and they laughed at me. They, they thought it was very, I was so mortified, and I swore I would never do that again. But I did. All my girlfriends could, would have a drink, and then they would stop. And I never drank unless I ended up getting sick. You know, I, I've always hated people that can really drink, you know, and, and not have any consequences. I always did. Um, I was an overachiever and work in an industry that some of you also work in. And uh, I became what I did for a living. And it almost killed me because people used to say to me, I was way too sweet to be successful in that industry. So I be try to become hip, slick, and cool. And I never was. I never did a good job at it. And what I did instead was take some Valium. I used to be. <laughs> I used to be so proud of, of taking something like Valium instead of aspirin for, you know, I, I just thought that was better than vitamins. And in any case, I got to be 39 years old, and I got to uh, get sober. Now, what I'm 
while I was growing up, my father was, he, took, he hated me, and I hated him. I remember living in the same house with him for about, oh, I guess about four or five years, and we never said a word to each other. There was just absolute no communication. And so I never knew what it was like for a father to say, I love you, or you're a nice kid, or whatever. And what happened was that when I became a young lady, I married a father. And he said all those words to me, but he was a very strict father, you see, and uh, I ended up being a battered wife. And uh, that went on for a long time. I happened to get, um, for, I was in a blackout, I called someone that we were courting an asshole. And I, I, I was horrified because we had been courting this person for about three years, and in a blackout, I called him an asshole. And uh, the next day, my husband at that time said, I don't think you should have done that. And fortunately for me, I got mad at alcohol. I thought, I'll be a son of a bitch if I'm going to ruin my career because of alcohol. So I got mad, and I got sober. It was on a New Year's Day, and uh, I had a little girl that, um, that had somehow discovered that I had um, an issue with alcohol. And we had, um, in our dining room, we had a little cabinet. And I would try so delicately. We had the wine in the cabinet. And I would open the cabinet door so lightly so that no one would hear that I was drinking again. And this little voice would come out of the darkness and say, Mommy, you don't have to do that. I love you. You know, and I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed. And uh, so um, I, um, I, I called central office. And I said, a friend of mine has a problem with alcohol. <laughs> and so they put me on hold. And so they said, I guess they got a woman. And I, told, I tried to tell her the same story. And she put me on hold. And then, damn it, finally someone came back and I told them that I had a problem. And so they sent me to a meeting, and uh, it was uh, really rather amazing. Uh, I said, I want to go to a meeting, but I don't want to go to one of those meetings. And so they sent me to a meeting in Hollywood with a speaker meeting, a gay speaker meeting, a gay men's speaker meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and there were, about, there were about three women there. One had a black raincoat with different colors of, I think about four or five different shades of purple in her hair. And the other one was talking about God. And I was so horrified to have been in a place like that. And uh, I, the only thing that could have been worse is that someone would recognize me. And so my neighbor came up and said hi. <laughs> I love the laughter of AA. You guys, I don't know you, but that's, that's so great. But I know you, and you know me. Um, after I was sober a while, um, let me just tell you also, it, my background is a little bit different than Trudy's because my brother died of a heart attack two weeks after I got sober. And so, and I had been to two meetings, and what's so wonderful about this program? And what happened for me? I had been to one AA meeting after that AA meeting, and then there was one more I went to, and there was a woman speaking, and she was sharing that she had just finished her second mastectomy, that she had just gotten her CPA license, that she was um, just finishing um, something else. She, she was, her divorce was just finishing, and that her kids were doing crazy stuff, and that that week before that she had come home to her living room and it was her new couch, white couch and sofa, the whole thing, were floating in her living room. And so she said, and so I went skiing. <laughs> Later that night I got the call that my brother had died and I went back to that family and uh, all I saw was her eyes, this woman's eyes. 
I just kept seeing her eyes because I, I'm a con and I can smell a con and I could tell she was telling the truth and uh, that kept me sober. So I came back and uh, I got involved with the We Agnostics group. One day a gentleman came up to me and saw that I wasn't saying the Lord's Prayer and I said, and what of it? And uh, so he, he said, my name is Charlie Polachek and uh, I've been sober for nine years, and uh, I'm an atheist. And uh, I said, great, let me, let me be with you. And uh, so I just kept coming back. And uh, one day he came up to me, because he had seen I was still around. Everything happened to me when I was about six months sober. And he said, you know, he said, I have a son in Corpus Christi, Texas that I visit. And he said, when I'm visiting him, he said they have um, a meeting there for NASA scientists, and they, they you know, they're, you know, those scientist types. He said they're, uh, a lot of them are atheists and so on, but they have their own AA meeting, and uh, it seems to work. And he said, how would you like to help me start an, um, a We Agnostics meeting out here? And I said, absolutely. So together we started a We Agnostics meeting in Los Angeles. And... Uh, it was really very cute because we attracted some of the really wonderful, wonderful minds in the city. We attracted judges and nuns and priests and so on. And, we, we, and here we all sat around like little children trying to find a higher power, you know? And so we, we would try each other's higher power on, you know? Some were too soft, some were too, you know, some were too hard. And, and um, fortunately, for me during this process is that I got to learn the art of translation. And uh, that helped me survive. Uh, when I was, I guess, I guess I was about two, I had, uh, finally I ended up in about two, after about two and a half years sober, I ended up at a battered woman's shelter. And I took my little girl with me at that time. And uh, my life was changing tremendously was really tough for her because I, you know, when we get sober, sometimes we become teenagers, you know, and I was uh, like a 42-year-old teenager, and so was she, and so we, we were both after the same mirror, you know, and it, it was really, it was really tough, <laughs> tough on her because I, I, I felt I had been cheated of my girlhood because the man I had married, this very strict father, uh, he was a lot older than I was, and so I always had to be older. Time went by, and uh, my daughter has her own story, you know Erin, and um, so she has her own story, but what happened with me is after I left this husband and started getting my life together, I was at a meeting one day in Santa Monica, and across from me sat a gentleman, I guess he had about 35 years of sobriety. And I looked at him and he had these bright blue eyes. I don't even remember his name. He had these wonderful eyes and he looked at me and I looked at him and I said, you know, you remind me of my father. You look like my father. And so I said, but you, instead of looking at me with hatred, you're looking at me with love. And so I said, boy, do I want to talk to you. And so we made a date, and we met and for breakfast. And I told him all the things that had hurt me, that, how my father had hurt me over the years. And he just sat there and he listened. And, um, and he told me he loved me. And that's the last time I ever saw him. And it was a healing. It helped me. For a person to have come from so much damage that I had to a place of being, uh, within a mere 20 years, to be in a place most of the time to be happy, joyous, and free, it's impossible. It's impossible in one lifetime. And I came to the program for everything. You know, you taught me everything. I remember saying to my sponsor once, I see, I see people reading the newspaper. And she said, that's right, honey. She always said, honey. <laughs> I said, do you think I can read the newspaper? And she said, yes. 
And I said, but it's overwhelming. And the, so she said, well, just read through it. And whatever attracts you, you read. And so I started doing that. And lo and behold, things started becoming of interest to me. I remember when I started dating, I was with definitely the wrong kind of men. And Shirley will attest to that. She said I was really sick. My sponsor um, at that time said, you know, she said to me, do you like your life? And I said, no, hell no. She said, well, what makes you think any healthy man would like to share your life? <laughs> so she said, honey, that's a honey again. She said, what I did was I decided to become selfish. And so I chose, I took three years to deal with my stuff. And, uh, and she said, why don't you do that? So I said, okay. And um, even though, see, the, the thing about me was when I kept drinking, even though it was killing me uh, and, and, and taking my little sweet Valium, when I was doing that, it was killing me. And I, but no matter how much pain I was in, I just kept doing the same damn thing. When I got sober, that's the other side of the coin. Because no matter what was happening in my life, I just kept staying sober, no matter what. You know, you could hit me with anything. It didn't matter. I stayed sober. And uh, the program has just been so wonderful in my life. Um, I got my bachelor's degree about three years ago. You know, um, that's what we do in this program. One of the things that, that has occurred to me is that nothing changes just because I want it. I can't speak fluent French until I take French, French lessons. How about practicing, you know, and uh, speaking French, maybe even going to France and um, experiencing that. I have learned how to take risks with you and fortunately, you know what I did from the beginning? I always hung out with people who were healthier than myself. I, because I didn't want what I had. So I always hung out with people that were like two or three steps ahead of me. And uh, then what also happens in this program is I got healthier and healthier and healthier. And some of the people that were ahead of me, I started getting ahead of them, you know, and I just kept growing. There was a young lady that took a cake some years ago, and she was taking a cake for three years. And uh, what she said was this. She said, I am becoming a woman I never imagined. And this goes for men or women, except if you're a man trying to be a woman. That might work too, but anyway. <laughs> what she said was, I'm becoming a person that I never thought possible. And I got news for you. After that, my experience has been, is about three years later, I got to be a woman that I couldn't even dream of. And if you're willing to keep growing and still taking risks, then you get to go further and be another person that, that you never dreamed of. And we change, you know, we change and we change. My mother used to say, dear, when you grow up, <clears throat> excuse me, dear, when you grow up, you'll, you know, you'll meet a man and, and, you know, like you're one part of the circle and he's one part of the circle. And when the two of you come together, it's a circle. And mom was half right. But if two circles, if you become a circle, you attract another circle and then you come together, and then you become a ball with dimension. You know, I thought to myself, if I have to be in these rooms, I'm going to get everything I can out of it. I don't want to, I never want a little piece of anything. You know, give me the whole pie or nothing. You can have it. And so I came into this program with a vengeance. I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know what else has happened to me, and I don't know if it's happened to you. I learned skills in this program of, excuse me, of trying to get out of judgment of you, accepting you if you're different than me, 
except politically. <laughs> and it's worked for me in business. What I've learned to do is to take that stuff outside into the other world and use it, and it's very effective. It's very effective. People know I'm different. Either that's very good or bad, but uh, they, they just know I'm loving. And I don't tell them. I don't break my anonymity in the outside world. Life is, is very good uh, for me. Uh, that little girl that I had got sober. She was a teenage alcoholic. And I used to bring her to AA meetings with me. And at, back then, people used to say, what's she doing in an AA meeting? She should be in Alateen. So I push her into Alateen. And then she kept bouncing back to AA with me. And so finally, someone said, point blank, is she, is your daughter an alcoholic? And I said, no, she's my daughter. You know that way we do? And so she, <laughs> afterwards, Aaron said to me, how dare you tell them I'm not an alcoholic? You know, she really gave me hell. And uh, so she went ahead and proved it, you know. <laughs> Beyond my greatest thoughts, actually. Could have taught me a few things. But, uh, and then I met a healthy man. You know, of course, I. oh, that's another thing I did. I used to go to the meeting in the valley, you know, and uh, the hole in the sky. And I, I was told, bring it to the program. So I said one time, I was told by my sponsor that I need to meet healthy men and become friends with healthy men. So will all the healthy men please stand over there, you know, <laughs> that I could become friends with? And so they lined up. And I said, I, I said, I'm not going to sleep with you. I don't think they believed it. But they, but you know, I, I said, I was told that I can't have one of you until I can make friends with nice men, you know? And actually, I also came to the program and talked to the ladies. And I said, I need to learn more about that world of intimacy. And so these, all these former prostitutes came up, and they gave me some lessons, too. <laughs> so I've, I've, I have, right? <laughs> I have come to the program for everything. You know? One of the things that happened also, am I, am I at all like Erin, or is she real, real conservative compared to me, right? Um, one of the things that also happened to me, and that's why I think this program is so remarkable, there was a gentleman that had about 35 or 40 years of sobriety, and he had terminal cancer. And he, was, he knew he was dying. And he came to the podium, and he was coming here to say goodbye to us. And he, what he said is, some of you are very young, and some of you are closer to where I am. And he said, and I'm just here to tell you that it was worth it and that it can happen with dignity. And so he said, so just put it back, put it somewhere in the back of your mind that this can, this can happen this way. And this wonderful man had such aristocracy of the spirit, you know, and he taught me something. And, you know, and, and, and that's what we do for each other here. You know, in, in, in this program, we get to be the 20-year um, ex-con. We get to hear the stories of the ladies of the night. We get to hear all the stories. And we get to hear them all. And um, we get to take them in. What's also so wonderful about this program is that some of us come into meetings and we're very high, and some others of us are very low. And we hear what we need to hear, and we leave, and uh, we're feeling a lot better. Because when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't stay here because of your fashion. I, I didn't stay here because you were very clean or, or shampooed. Um, I <laughs> stayed here because every day that I stayed here and listened to you, it helped me 
put off the ultimate decision of committing suicide. So I surrounded myself with some very shiny candles and uh, you kept me sober and you taught me how to not be afraid. You taught me how to face my fears. And the amazing thing happens after years, after you get in the habit of facing your fears, there aren't that many. And when you for me, when I recognize that there is a real fear out there, instead of walking away from it, I walk and face it right on. And that's what you've taught me. This is a wonderful program, and I neglected to thank my guys, my, my gals, for giving me my cake. And uh, I love this program. Thank you very much. This has been another typical Saturday night meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now we will have an announcement from our secretary, Bill. Bill eh? oh, there's one more thing. I'm Bill, your co-secretary. I'm also an alcoholic. Oh, I'm not the co-secretary. It sucks, man. I'm the secretary. I'll get it right one of these days. I'd like to thank uh, the speakers that came um, up from Newport, all the way from uh, Orange County tonight, Trudy and Meg. <laughs> thank you, both of you. Um, I'd also like to welcome the newcomers. Um, if you could please just stand so we can get to know you after the meeting. People in their first 30 days. We'd like to welcome you to make this a regular meeting, and please keep coming back. Uh, let's congratulate all the uh, birthday people and the out-of-towners for coming. A lot of birthdays tonight. I'll have to mark that in my calendar next year. Um, we're going to have a literature announcement from Willis here. Willis, Willis, I'm out of hey, Willis. Cover books, big books. I also have the big, big book with big types. You can still load it. You can still read it. <laughs> <laughs> All the services free. I have meeting directors for a dollar. And I have lists for newcomers of men and women who are willing to talk to you anytime, day or night, 3 o'clock in the morning. Hey, okay. Come get a list, whatever you need. Thanks, Willis. Uh, we may can sell tapes of this meeting. Uh, if you'd like to buy a tape of this meeting, Chris will explain that to you. Hi, I'm Chris, your alcoholic tape person. Hey. You show up right here after the meeting with four dollars in your hands. I'll have a tape for you next week of the speakers. If you give me five dollars, I'll mail it to you. So please see me right here afterwards. And if you're a newcomer, please come over. We've got a special rate for you. Thanks. Um, we're going to have an announcement from our chair wrangler. Yeah, my name is Jeff, uh, your alcoholic chair wrangler. <laughs> and uh, we've got those chairs 26 high. Meet me at the back if you want to help out, and we'll get it done. Thank you. All right. <laughs> when he means 26 high, there's little carts we put them on. They'll fall over otherwise. So if you want to help with that, please please pitch in. And if everybody could just pick up any trash around your area, try not to kick the coffee cups over. There's a recycling bin in the back if you want to pitch in that way. Parking lot closes at 10 o'clock. If you want your car for the rest of the weekend, you need to have it out by 10. Um, hey, that's what it says in our lease, you know. Come get it on Monday. Um, there's a late night meeting after this meeting at Malibu Canyon at the Bluffs Park. It's Malibu Canyon and Pacific Coast Highway at 10.30. It's a candlelight meeting. 
I don't have any flyers for that or anything, but check it out if you need another meeting. And I'd like to thank Shirley for leading a great meeting. And I'd like to thank Dan for arranging for the speakers this week. Um, I'd like to thank him for doing that and thank him for being my co-secretary. And uh, court cards can be signed by me or Dan here at the podium. If you have a court card, uh, bring it on up. We'd be happy to sign it. Thanks for letting me be of service. I was going to have Sheila come up and, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I would like to thank Pete for reading uh, the fifth tradition and uh, Leslie for reading the 12 and 12. And after a moment, silent meditation, Sheila, will you please come up and read a, uh, the serenity prayer? Lead us in the serenity prayer. Hmm. Thank <laughs> you.